What up YouTube? This is Steven and welcome back to another video. In this video I'm going to share an article that I found via the internet called Hikaru Utada and the Iconic Women of Japanese Pop Who Came Before Her by Ian Martin. And this was published in the Japan Times. And I think this article is extremely interesting because it goes um, and it talks about kind of pretty much um, the queens of J-pop from each era, you know, because of course we know about the um, three major contenders for the title, you know, for the throne, but there's other people who came before them, you know, <clears throat> so it's like, you know, learning your J-pop history, you know. So here we go. Here we go. Let's get into this article. <clears throat> In an age where anyone, and it often seems anyone, um, well, it often seems everyone. Sorry. Let me start over. Let me get this right. <clears throat> In an age where anyone and everyone can be an idol, it takes something special to be an icon. Okay. All right. All right. Seem like, okay, Ian going in, you know, right off the bat. <clears throat> so basically, you know, anyone can be an idol. But, you know, it takes someone special to be an icon. All right, now. An icon should stand apart from their peers and embody the spirit of their generation. They should be distinct to a particular time and place while at the same time transcending it. True. You know, that is true. I don't like how they say, they do it like first name, last name with Utada, so it's like Hikaru Utada, but for, to me that sounds a little odd, so I'm just going to refer to her as Utada Hikaru or Utada. Alright, here we go. Utada Hikaru is perhaps the only contemporary Japanese pop figure who fully inhabits this role. I beg to differ, um, but by looking at her predecessors, we can find some revealing reflections of both Utada herself and the eras that help define. All right, so here we go. In the late 90s, Utada's most immediate predecessor was Namie Amuro, with an image that was modern and fashionable in contrast to the girlish idol eras that bracketed it. Namie represented a period when Japanese pop was learning to see itself as something that could stand alongside the Western music from which it took many cues. All right, so of course you know I know about you know Namie, you know, <clears throat> and I will say you know that is true. You know, no, you know Namie was you know the queen of J-pop during the '90s. You know, the undisputed queen of um, '90s J-pop. You know, no one can take that from her. Um, <clears throat> you know. And I feel like, you know, ultimately, you know, sometimes the critics and people would like to separate maybe Utada and Namie from each other because Utada's more so like a singer songwriter, you know, while Namie, on the other hand, is more so like an idol, but, um, you know, Namie is more than an idol. You know, Namie is more than an idol. I'll just put it out there like that. Because <clears throat> I know some people kind of throw that up like, oh, you know, Utada writes her songs, you know? And also they be saying like, people going in on Namie like, oh, Namie doesn't write her song. She's just an old idol. I'm like, whoa. Slow your roll. Namie is not an old idol. Namie does have creative control of her career, okay? Just because she doesn't write the majority of her songs doesn't mean that she is not involved in the creative process and being able to pick the songs that she likes and pick the songs that she wants to sing, you know? She did start out as an idol. That is true, you know? Namie ain't ashamed of her idol origins, but the thing is, Namie is more than an idol. 
And I'm just putting it out there for some of you folks who be all like, mm, don't compare Utana to Nami, eh? You know, as if that's like a bad, or as if it's like comparing like Utada to like something terrible. You know, I'm like, chill. <clears throat> All right, so that was my rant, but let me get back to business here. <clears throat> Nami represented the period when Japanese pop was learning to see itself as something that could stand alongside the Western music from which it took many cues. Utada took this even further in her background growing up in the United States, adding an extra veneer of authenticity to her already unusually slick take on R&B, eclipsing both Nami and her other main rival of the era, Ayumi Hamasaki. Okay, I take issue with that because I know Utada did come on the scene and she did come on strong. You know, she has the best selling album in Japanese pop music history. That is true. I give her her props for doing that. I do. However, let's put this into context though. Um, Namie had taken hiatus from the industry. So, like, Nami wasn't on the scene at that time when they came back. Well, when Nami came back, Utada and Ayumi had came on the scene. They were already on the scene. Like, when she kind of came back and came, you know, started doing music again. <clears throat> and it kind of seems like if you don't put it in the context, it just seems like, you know, Nami was doing her thing. And then all of a sudden, just Utada just came along and then, bam, you know, just took it off. And that's not exactly the case. And as far as Ayumi Hamasaki is concerned, um, Ayumi was going like toe to toe and head to head with um, Utada when it came to record sales. You know, when they both debuted, I would say that um, I would say Ayumi, when she first came on the scene, it took her a minute to um, gain record sales, but she did. You know. Well, I guess Utana came on it, you know, claiming record sales. But ultimately, they were going, like, head-to-head -head on record sales, you know. So, you know, to the author, Ian Martin, you know, don't be throwing shade at the other two contenders for the Queen of J-Pop throne like that, you know. I know that you probably, you know, are in Utana tot you know and utada tot you know you're part of the utada armada um and you know i have no problems with anyone who's in a utada tot and who's a part of the utada armada you know um <clears throat> i just don't want the utada armada to be throwing sh you know firing shots over at the iu army or the namie parade you know because it's not well the shots shouldn't be fired and also the shots aren't exactly totally you know put in the context and totally the truth in my opinion and also you know um just besides my opinion but i think i can have some facts to support that um but i'll end my rant and go on with this article <clears throat> all right if an icon is defined in part by longevity then few can surpass Seiko Matsuda, a singer who remains the face of 1980s Japan. While, Ma while Seiko and Utada's careers have parallels with both dominating domestic charts while misfiring in their attempts to transfer that success to the States, they are largely opposites. That is true. Um, I'll give you some um, backstory on Seiko. Seiko was like the queen of J-Pops during the 80s. Um, <clears throat> you know, pretty much the undisputed queen of J-Pop during the 80s. You know, she had like a long string of number one hits that was ultimately, um, she was ultimately outdone by Ayumi Hamasaki, but she was like the first one to have that record, or at least, you know, she held on to that record for a long time. Um, and also Seiko Matsuda was kind of like, probably one of the first to really try to um you know sing in english as well as like take you know try to break into the united states music industry you know and as if you search youtube you can find some footage i did find like an interview that um you know seiko and 
um, Donnie Wahlberg did um, a while back. Because <clears throat> if you um, know, like, um, Seiko and Donnie wind up doing a duet together um, called The Right Combination. <clears throat> Oddly enough, I don't think their voices were the right combination. But, you know, um, you know, Donnie Wahlberg were, was Seiko Matsuda's co-sign when she came to the United States. And she released, you know, she kept trying, you know, she released, like, I think at least three albums, if not four, um, in the, you know, to break into the U.S. market, you know, singing in English, but ultimately it just didn't pop off for some reason. I don't know why. <clears throat> and, of course, Utada, um, she's, you know, tried to break into the U.S. market, too, uh, with Exodus and with This Is The One. Um, and, ultimately, um, nothing really came of it. Um, Exodus did do well, but it did well in Japan, which was not its, its intended market. It was intended for the Western market. And in the Western market in the United States, it sold more or less like 50,000 copies. Yeah, not really a success. <clears throat> All right, let's move on to the next part of this article. Uh, Seiko's sweet, hyper-cute image masked a fierce ambition, and she was first and foremost an idol rather than an artist. Her legacy is best expressed in singles rather than albums. Seiko was all about artifice. I think that's how you say it. While Utada urges you to consider the substance. Okay, so they're throwing shade at Seiko, saying basically she's about, you know, superficial, um, you know, the surface and whatnot, but Utada's about the substance and, you know, you know, deep and profound. All right, Ian. All right. <clears throat> um, Seiko did wind up eventually starting to write her own material. You know, um, you know, she her origins was as an idol. She did she did start out as an idol, as did Namie. Um, but you know, Seiko did keep going, and she, um, I believe, she started writing her material at one point. Um, and being a part, more of a, um, play more of a part in the creative process, um, <clears throat> you know. And I think her legacy is probably best expressed in singles rather than albums. Um, but I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. But I guess he's not saying it's a bad thing. Um, but I guess that Utada's legacy is maybe best expressed in album sales or, in, you know, albums. All right, on to the next. For a better understanding of what Utada is aiming for, it may be more useful to look at who wrote Seiko's hits, with some of the biggest being the work of another female pop icon, Yumi Matsutoya. Matsutoya. Okay, so Yumi, I never heard of Yumi. Um, I think, let's see, let's go on. At the same time, she was contributing to Seiko's record-breaking run of number one hits. Um, Yumi's own work retained an almost militant focus on albums and the balance she struck between commercial success and artistic integrity is a source of inspiration to many inspiring musicians. Okay, I didn't know that, um, you know, you know, kind of like, the previous queen of J-pop was writing hits for a, the um, queen of J-pop who came after her. That is interesting. <laughs> so, like, Yumi was, write, was helping write uh, Seiko's hit songs. So, it's kind of like, if, it's kinda like um, maybe, like, Namie helping, um, you know, Utada or Ayumi Hamasaki, um, you know, giving them song lyrics. A little bit <clears throat> it would be a little strange you know let's see when Utada chose the path of singer-songwriter over idol consciously or not she was following in Yumi's footsteps all right all right and I think Utada she may have been able to do that I think, you know, Utada, you know, let's keep it real, y'all. Utada does have a connection to the music industry through her parents. You know, people don't really bring this up, but I think Utada may be 
a product of possibly nepotism. But um, I think people probably don't bring it up because Utada is so successful that, you know, nepotism alone couldn't generate the success that Utada has had. Um, however, I will say that it sort of, you know, just a little bit sort of takes away from, like, you know, Utada's, um, you know, success story. Because it's like, you know, her parents were part of the industry, so she kind of probably had a connection already. You know, versus, like, say, you know, Ayumi Hamasaki and Nami Amuro, they didn't have connections to the industry. You know? Um... You know, Ayumi was um, spotted by, I think, Max. I forget his last name. But um, she was spotted by, um, like, an ABEX executive uh, named Max something. And he pretty much just um, helped her and helped her get to where she is today. And Namie, she started off um, at the Okinawa's after school. Uh, and then... She ultimately, from there, was able to join the Super Monkeys and kind of break into the industry from there. And then when she went solo, like before she went solo, um, I think Max, um, the AVEX executive, also, you know, got in contact with Namie. You know. <clears throat> let's see. All right. So let's move on to the next part. When Utada and Yumi differ, well, where Utada and Yumi differ most is in the background and environment. As a teen, Yumi, then known by her birth name, Yumi Are, was hanging out in vibrant late 1960s and early 1970s artistic circles that included novelist Kobo Abe, filmmaker Akira Kurosawa, and mus musicians like Haruo Mi Hosono, Akiko Yano, and others. Surrounded by creative equals, Yumi's career has been characterized by collaborations, most prominently with her husband, Masataka Matsutoya. Okay, so I think, um, you know, Yumi is like the queen of the collaborations, you know. While I think Seiko is like the queen of the singles. <laughs> you know. Next, born in New York, removed from the beating heart of the Japanese music scene, Utada's first spray into music came through the more insular world of her musical parents under the name U3. Indeed, her Inca singer mother, Kieko Fuji, is perhaps Utada's single most defining. Define Musical influence. Defining most musical influence. Inca may seem far from the R&B influence pop she's most famous for, but with its raw emotional appeal, Inca in its heyday is perhaps the closest parallel to the role Utada plays among her own generation. Mm -hmm. uh, sidebar, quick, a quick sidebar. I heard um, the singer um, Gerald uh, J E R O. Um, he referred to Inca as sort of like um, making a comparison between Inca and uh, the blues, kind of like the Japanese blues or the Japanese, kind of like a Japanese variation of the blues, perhaps. You know. <clears throat> so if you don't know what Inca is, you know, think about the blues. You know, <clears throat> even though it's not the same sound, it's the same feel, you know, the same emotion. That's where they're coming from with it when it's about Inca, you know, the blues. In the 50s and 60s, you know, in the 1950s and the 1960s, the biggest star was undoubted, undoubtedly Inca singer Hibari Misura. Misura. First, a plucky child star who lifted Japan's shattered spirits after the war. Habari grew up and matured alongside the post-war generation, channeling their ex experiences through her music. So I think she, Hibari Misora, she was the first queen of J-pop, y'all. Um, you know, 
<clears throat> well, I guess technically the queen of Inca, but in this time period, Inca was considered like, you know, the popular music of that time. So you can argue that she was like pretty much the queen of J-pops during the 50s and the 60s, you know. So she was like, you know, the original, the OG queen of J-pop, you know. <clears throat> Um, unfortunately, I think she passed away. I think she passed away at like 55 years old um, due to an illness. I think maybe some type of a cancer, I think. Uh, unfortunately. Let's see. The impact of Utada's return after her 2011 hiatus stems in part from how she has connected to the generation that has grown up alongside her. However, if a body has transcended mere pop stardom to become a mythical figure from some fable of the reconstruction and Seiko embodies the glitz and glamour of the bubble era's excess, Utada is something a little more subdued and even melancholy. Uh, here comes that whole melancholy thing again with Utada. Like, why are you so depressed, Utada? <laughs> But yeah, I heard some folks refer to her as like the queen of melancholy, you know, you know, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> See, bursting onto the scene in 1998 amid delayed banking collapses that followed the bursting of the bubble economy, the wounds of the 1995 Kobe earthquake and the Tokyo subway gas attack still fresh. Utada is an icon for a generation united in their sense of alienation. Hmm. Her current return comes in the aftermath of her mother's tragic death in 2013 and the hope represented by the birth of her son last year. Perhaps the message Utada greets her generation with as they struggle through a fresh era of uncertainty is simply, we'll get through this one too somehow. And that's the end of the article. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, you know, I did learn some information because I knew about. Of course, I know about the um, you know the three um, contenders for the uh, Queen of J-pop throne currently. You know, Utada, Ayumi, Namie, and I also knew about Seiko, but I didn't know about uh, Yumi and Habardi. I didn't know about uh, those two because, you know, I don't really go back that far. Really, going back to the 80s in J-pop is probably as far as I went. And I've only gone back that far a little bit with Seiko. Just hearing little things here and there from Seiko. Um, so, yeah, I thought that um, this article, you know, was kind of educational. You know, you know, learn your queen of J-pop history, you know. Or else, you know, if you don't learn your queen of J-pop history, then... They say um, you're doomed to repeat it, um, <clears throat> but, you know, I don't know if that's a bad thing in this case, you know, but still, it's good to know your queen of J-pop history and know the trailblazers and um, the icons and the ones who really, you know, are really kind of like changed the game and changed how things work. You know, and know their influence. So, I think ultimately, um, I did like um, that aspect of the article. I didn't like the aspect of the article where Utada seems to, seems to be being, like, lifted up unnecessarily above other folk. You know, like, I mean, I know Utada is awesome, you know. So, Utada Armada, you know, you know, put down your cannons, you know, <clears throat> your ship cannons here for a second. Um, but yeah, um, I just feel like maybe the author kind of threw shade unnecessarily at other folks. But overall, um, I think it was a nice article. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. Feel free to comment. Feel free to subscribe. Feel free to give me a thumbs up. Feedback and support are extremely appreciated and extremely valued. Until the next video, <clears throat> adios and goodbye for now especially to the Utanatats slash the Utana Armada. <laughs>